Iceland and Norwegian Svalbard. And the aim was to improve Nordic cooperation through common general management principles <clears throat> and to strengthen the protection and status of heritage sites in the Arctic. It was also an aim to strengthen important heritage values in all the circumarctic region with a selection of sites in the three named areas that stand as examples. In addition to the common Arctic subarctic situations, the selected sites all had their own characteristics in order to give us a broad example background. Our recommendations were fundamental principles that could be adapted to local conditions and which were adjusted to four management levels. The local authorities and interest groups <clears throat> with the direct management or interest in the site, which was a very important first step. But then they need the, um, the levels above, which were the regional authorities with responsibility, for example, area regulation and general management planning. Then above them, the national authorities and lawmakers, we need the legislation in, in place. And then finally, the fourth level was the uh, joint Nordic cooperation, which we hoped would be able to be carried forward with the uh, uh, four or four uh, Nordic uh, cultural heritage workers hasn't quite uh, uh, come true in that way, but in, in many other ways. So the report was accepted by the Nordic Council of Ministers and published, as I said, both paper and online. But as always, the big question is, who reads it? Who, get, who gets hold of it? How do they get hold of it? Maybe this uh, haunting question can be discussed later during this session, how to reach out successfully. Local populations, museums and interest groups are always important to have along where such are to be found. Um, obviously, this ranges between the very high Arctic and then down towards the subarctic. So then the second project I'll mention was um, Arctic Council Social Development Working Group project on the assessment of cultural heritage monuments and sites in the Arctic, which was presented the results in uh, 2013. This was introduced into the uh, social development working group by Norway and was accepted. Um, partly we were building on the, the previous work from the Nordic Council of Ministers. And I just keep an eye on the time here. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the aim was again, better management and protection, but this time of internationally significant cultural heritage sites around the Arctic. So it was an extension for the first project. Um, but these sites had to be important to native peoples and to visitors alike, both through their history and their present and future significance. The main working group were representatives from Norway, Svalbard, the Sami, Greenland, US Arctic, Canada and Russia, while input was received from another number of others, not least representatives for na native peoples and discussions with local indigenous groups, which happened all across Canada in, in quite a um, a large uh, operation. So the aims were to formulate criteria for designating a site for exceptional international significance, to create a list of 25 to 30 such sites around the Arctic, and to present, not least, a statement of best practice for site management. The list of sites was intended both to lift these particular sites and their values towards better appreciation by the relevant authorities with an eye to better management and also for the example sites and recommendations and also for the example sites and recommendations could encourage protection of all national cultural heritage sites in the arctic uh, they could resemble the complex the um, concept of world heritage sites but world heritage designation in the arctic is not always a good idea as we know that it does increase uh, visitation uh, quite a lot and with the following risk of overuse, but also because we wanted to encompass more sites than those that could become world heritage in order to increase their status. We were also clear that intangible values should be considered, religious, myths, spirit of place, feeling for and experience of the landscape being essential also for the material heritage. This time there's much more politics involved with discussions over individual words, and worries about national jurisdiction contra circumarctic management guidelines. So although the report was received with many good words, the final decision was to publish it as a project report 
without it becoming an Arctic Council recommendation, which of course reduces its visibility. But we did not want to compromise too much concerning our recommendations, just watering them down to, to uh, suit absolutely all political uh, opinions. Uh, the recommendations are mostly about good management, but they should also give pointers to possible scientific projects, such as the collection and analysis of information about sites, for example, through archaeology, studies of degenerative agents and conservation methods, studies of the place of sites within different parts of a society. And of course, all of you out there can think of your own ways into such uh, scientific projects. So then I'll just mention two international organizations uh, on the scientific side. If you can put up this third slide, uh, Emily. Um, the first one is about the International Arctic Science Committee, IAS. And I'm sure many of you, I hope very many of you, are very well acquainted with IAS. So I was president there uh, 2014 to 18, and the first president from the humanities. And my intention was to front social sciences and humanities and bring them more into the forefront. Uh, watching the um, though it, We will always be smaller disciplines compared with the hard sciences. But for example, PAN, Polar Archaeology Network, we'll hear about it in just a minute, uh, was approved as an, uh, a network uh, uh, associated with um, the Arctic, in, with IAS in 2010. Uh, it's a place where you can get uh, contacts and some money sometimes, so do all be aware of IAS. Then the second one in my last slide, the uh, International Polar Heritage Committee, uh, which was formed to bring together those working with Arctic and or Antarctic cultural heritage in many relevant professions, whether conservation, management, archaeology, architecture, anything. It's an international scientific Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. So our members should also be members of ECOMOS first. But we do have a, a system of associates uh, who are not members of ECOMOS, but who uh, join us for, with mutual benefit. We're a forum for discussions and information exchange about scientific problems and questions, management, conservation, and so on. Uh, particularly for the last two years, we've worked um, with Antarctic heritage, since this has been more or less an open area without expertise. And we're now accepted as an expert group within the treaty system. But the Arctic, of course, has more national focus, but the IPHC is a forum for bringing scientists together with the aim of enhancing all research that benefits polar cultural heritage. Our conferences and publications, you can see the three first ones here, uh, are one method for doing this. And then I think my time is out, so thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Susan. That was really excellent, and uh, you raised some interesting questions, so hopefully we'll be able to get to it in the discussion time. And next now we have um, we have Dr. Frigga Cruz, who is the chair of the Polar Archaeology Network. Frigga is currently a researcher at Kiel University in Germany. Friga has expertise with geology and archaeology and is based and has lots of expertise in Svalbard and Jan Mayen. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from you, Friga. So I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. So I don't have to introduce myself too much. Now, I don't have any slides to share. So instead, I would like to invite everyone who spent the last two months on Zoom meetings to just close your eyes and relax and listen. Um, there is nothing particularly visible here, but I hope to stimulate your ears and your mind. So um, I'm speaking here today as the relatively new chair of PEN, the Polar Archaeology Network. Um, I would like to add to my introduction that um, I'm at the Institute of Ecosystem Research in Kiel for a very good reason. I thought um, to be an archeologist at an Ecosystem Research Institute would enhance the interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, but also transdisciplinarity of my work and my message. So I very specifically aimed at that institute and I'm very lucky that they accepted me and my project. So that's just on a personal note. I see my role here today and I've 
not looked at the time, I have done so now. I see my role here today as uh, saying a few words on uh, PAN, the Polar Archaeology Network, and on giving a PAN perspective on the webinar's focus of cultural heritage protection and international cooperation. Now, to represent a network is a tricky one. You will never tickle everyone's fancy. So essentially, I'll be giving you my own perspective, but I hope to um, do my members or our members some justice. First and foremost, and also because Susan mentioned money, I'd like to point out that PAN is a network without money. I'll get back to that point. Um, it makes our role or our mission a well, tricky one, uh, an interesting one, but we are essentially a network without money. So if you uh, aim to get funded, um, do look at IAS by all means, do look at SCAR, um, but not to us. We have other foci. So who here has ever heard of PAN? Maybe very few. I know how many members we have at the moment and our membership is steadily increasing, but you may not have heard of it before. And I myself have been in the very lucky position that former colleagues of mine, and this is a hello to Honingen, Dark, Dark Avango, I've just uh, seen you in the crowd as well. Former colleagues of mine at the University of Honingen in the Netherlands have played various active parts um, on, the, on the pen board over the years. And, um, well, you know, you, you hear and you see what it's all about. So this is my initial contact with PAN. I do wonder how I would have heard about it otherwise. And as with all networks and organizations, they often rise and fall with the personal involvement and the personal commitment of the people behind the scenes. We all wish it wasn't so. Um, the people involved sometimes wish they had a lower workload maybe. Um, everyone has their uh, own reasons why they are or are not representing a network um, actively. But I think um, we can all agree that personal involvement is a huge driver. So a couple of years ago, I think it was the end of 2018, um, when a call for um, members for the board was opened, I asked myself, well, do I want to apply to sit on the Polar Archaeology Network's board? And if I did, who would I be to Pan, and what would Pan be to me? So you cannot only ask, well, there's a network, um, what can I get out of it? Very often it's also, what can I put into it? And when it comes to the question of putting something into a network, um, it very often is connected to how do you want to be represented? If you're not active in it, if you're not in it at all, then, then who's there to represent you? And, and can you be sure that you're, person, your profession, your um, opinions um, will be voiced, will be aired, and will receive visibility. So to me, these questions were always interlinked, interlinked. Who would I be to pan if I were to sit on the board? And what would the Polar Archaeology Network be for me? And the first thing I did for myself was define the word network. There's great joy in defining what you, what you think you already know. Um, sometimes it's surprising. The noun network has two simple definitions. The first one is an arrangement of intersecting horizontal and vertical lines. I'm sorry, I try to be creative, but I could not see the Polar Archaeology Network as an arrangement of intersecting lines. I like the second definition of the noun network much better, a group or a system of interconnected people or things. Since then, I've really come to like the word interconnected. Network has also, or is also a verb. The definition of the verb to network is to connect or operate as a network. That is self-explanatory. Slightly better is interact with others to exchange information and develop professional or social contacts. Exchanging information and developing professional or social contacts. I then looked left and right for uh, other net professional networks that I knew, like the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, and um, checked what they were offering their members. In many cases, it was money, and I could not compete with that. But uh, there was also something called or referred to as membership services. And to me, that led to the crystallization of what PEN could be to you not just to myself or who I could be to you, but what the whole network could be to you. 
And uh, we have now, and when I say we, this uh, I'm talking about the board, the current board of the Polar Archaeology Network, we have adopted a bottom-up approach to the definition of the network, and we are co-creating our membership services. So we're not making up our membership services for you. If we cannot, all of us, agree that this is a service that you would want and need, then maybe we shouldn't be doing it. Then the network would be hollow. And we are becoming more solid and more visible. I'm telling you now it's hard work. And being here is uh, one of the things that I love doing because I'm giving the network a voice and meaning. So this was one of the reasons why I agreed to speak for a few minutes on what PAN could be within the forum uh, we are making use of today. In my notes, I have in brackets now a word to you early career researchers out there and non-specialists as well. Yeah, listen well, not every budding, uh, budding archaeologist or heritage pro professional, right? The early career researchers out there needs to dabble in high level cultural heritage protection. But listen now, learn the talk and your time will come. So don't be overwhelmed when uh, people with a lot of experience, we've heard Susan, we will hear others talk about cultural heritage protection and you're just kind of phased by the term, your time will come. Same with international connection. Not every student or PhD project needs to dabble in high level international connection right now. But again, listen up right here. Your time will come and we, the board members of PAN, uh, the people behind the International Polar Heritage Committee, we will need you to step up and take our positions. So there's a totally legitimate and important point of you being here today, but do not be scared by us. Instead, search and, and seek the communication and the exchange. So coming back to the Polar Archaeology Network as an actor and a stakeholder in today's discussion, I firstly want to, and maybe some of you already Googled this, right? I was, firstly want to tell you where you can actually find us on the net, the Polar Archaeology net, uh, Network on the net. We have a landing page, and if Emily could be so kind and put the uh, landing page link into the Zoom chat right now, our, all our communication currently takes place via MailChimp, um, but we still barely know who is who, because not everyone has interacted with the possibilities that this uh, service provider gives and given us some background information of where they're active, what they're active in, what their research interests are. We're working on that. We're still refining the membership services based on who you are and raising our profile that way. And because I cannot be everything to the network, we don't have a website and we don't have a Facebook page or anything like it because I don't have the capacity and the board does not have the capacity to drive this. So we're waiting for someone to step up and say, you know what, I'm gonna be your next uh, web host. By all means, do. When the link is up, um, you'll see how simple the landing page is and how very simple the text is that I put on there. And our role in today's forum um, has something to do with the immediate importance of the Polar Archaeology Network as a communicator. Sending out newsletters, sending out ad hoc announcements via our um, free mailing list. There's no big hurdle in, in joining us. And I do see an intermediate role in science cooperation, but we need to know who we are and who we have and where we are and what we do to be able to cooperate scientifically, professionally. And in the longer term, we will be a great partner in the policy making aspects on regional and global scales. Um, we're working our way up to that. We will not be discussing these policy um, issues ourselves, but we will bring together the expertise. And I think this is some of my, yeah, I am nearing um, the end of um, my uh, few remarks. I'm glad Emily used the word remarks because I think this is very much what it is. It's not a um, uh, perfected talk, it's more a bunch of remarks. Pan, the Polar Archaeology Network, is currently bringing people and opinions together. We collect and, and gather the energy to inform and drive far-reaching processes. But as I said, we will probably never have money. Keep on looking for IASC and SCAR on that front. So we're bundling all your local expertise. And I'm looking at you, master students, I'm looking at you um, starting postdocs. We're bundling the, the expertise you have from your case studies 
um, not just archaeology, but anywhere in um, heritage uh, management, as it were, um, and, and really understanding specific cultural heritage is issues, um, and there are many, to then give a solid knowledge base to act nationally and, as the title suggests, internationally. So if anything, I hope you can see that um, the Polar Archaeology Network does have this bottom-up approach, and we are looking for the local, and we're looking for the case studies to bundle. And then we will hopefully inform all the way up um, to the IAS working groups and who knows the Arctic Council. And I will finish on that note. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frigga, and especially those words of advice for our many early career uh, scholars who are attending here today. Uh, the next speaker that we have is Dr. Clemente uh, Neklavari. Uh, Clemente is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Ulu and is a project leader at the International Center for Reindeer Husbandry. He is an expert on the Sami language and uh, culture, the Sami culture. Uh, so Clemente, you have the floor and we're very excited to hear about your remarks. Uh, thank you for introduction. Uh, can you... Emily, kindly uh, show uh, first slide. <clears throat> Dear experts and Arctic community, good morning or good day to you all. Purepevi Puokkai, my own language. Uh, I must warn you that there have been power outage in my village all day due to snowy and windy weather. So if I disappear from the tomb, power is off, but hopefully everything is going to be okay. And thank you for inviting me to speak in this seminar. And best wishes from Finnish Satmi Enontekia to you all. I will focus on my brief speech to the challenges that Sami culture is facing to protect their cultural heritage in changing climate. Background of the presentation is ethnographic field work and workshops organized in Finnish Sami land among Sami reindeer herders. And next uh, slide. Uh, Sami are indigenous people, lingual minority and own ethnic group. Some are one people living inside the borders of four national states and the only indigenous people in the European Union. Some languages and cultural forms are extremely endangered. Some are small people and smaller languages, like Umeo and Piteo Same have only a few thousand speakers. The largest language, North Sami, is also endangered. It's so important to notice that, that although North Sami has a moderate number of speakers, it can be regularly highly endangered. Throughout the ages, the Sami way of life has been based on nature and living with the nature. Different Sami groups have chosen different livelihoods, reindeer hunt, husbandry, fishing, hunting, gathering of combination of all these. Sami way of life is also founded strongly on handicrafts, tuotichi. Sami have made themselves almost all artifacts of their material culture. Environmental relationship and environmental perception are formed in activities in the environment. And next slide. Sami do not learn skills needing in the nature and knowledge on environmental conditions from the books. They learn practicing livelihoods and culture in the nature and learning from the older generations. Sami do not navigate in the nature with the help of maps or GPS system. They rely on, the, on their skills and knowledge. 
One of my infants told that reindeer works has to be learned in all seasons, all weather conditions and even of, of roguest conditions. One cannot do reindeer work only on happy sunny days. If reindeer are not herded in harsh snowfall or harsh frost, the foundation of the whole livelihood fades away. And next slide. Uh, climate change is a new normal in, in Sami, in the Sami. Sami people discuss on climate change, its effects, changes, treats, and of the future of Sami culture with, with each other. Climate change does not come alone. For the Sami climate change construct is not a single environmental phenomenon, but a local social and environmental phenomenon that has influence on everything. Climate has changed and continues on changing the environment, environmental conditions and has profound effect on how to practice, practice livelihoods, on know-how and language. I have interviewed Sami herders and asked what kinds of changes occur in their living environment in different seasons and how reindeer and humans react to these changes. I have classified over 70 changes. The number of observation increases if we analyze the changes in detail, for example, focusing on every animal and plant species. Changes are most evident in vegetation, weather condition and winter. Changes in condition have a direct effect to know-how. When traditional science for weather and condition don't apply anymore, the significance of traditional knowledge declines. And next slide. Uh, the simplified simplify diagram explains the factors that either sustain of threaten Sami culture and its traditions. I have been told that climate change does not really, really affect Sami people. Sami people are not forced to move to new areas because of rising sea level. Sami people can always find new livelihoods or change their livelihood morals. It, it does not harm if so, haze cannot be found to fill the Sami for shoes. Sami can always buy or make wool socks. But when there are no shoe haze, also know-how on shoe hay disappears. How to find this shoe haze? how to process the haze and how to use them. Climate change is a paradox. It happens rather slowly in person's life, but it affects the inner structures of culture, even to personality and nature of culture and people. Some people's culture and life are structured around traditional Sami livelihoods. If traditional Sami livelihoods disappear as a cultural way of life, Sami culture becomes thinner and loses part of its uniqueness. By product of climate change is raised for new Arctic resources. One effort is competition over living space and discussion over rights. When discussing with some reindeer herders, they highlight concern over future. Will reindeer herding, Sami language, language and know-how prevail and in what kind of world futures Sami generation will live? If Sami livelihoods disappear or lose their cultural features, do Sami people become only a lingual minority? Sami people are considering climate change as a cultural pro process. Do Sami people have a continuity as a people, as a, as a culture. 
And next slide. Uh, climate change is a concern, but some people regard the effects based on pragmatism. Some people are forced to live with it. There are no alternatives. One of my in informants told me, I do not know anything worse than having to work in, in an office as a white collar worker. What does the future hold for reindeer's army? It's uncertain. It's clear that some community cannot adapt without support from the society. I do not refer to financial support, but other kind of measures. Measures that, the, that, that, that let the Sami people be Sami. Not aiming to change Sami people as farmers, tourist, tourist guides, finish of ancient relics. Every Sami can choose their own path and way of life, but Sami must have a possibility to be a Sami and to live traditional Sami way of life. It's a great importance that Sami people, researchers and states would work together and enable cultural adaptation of Sami people to the climate change. It's important to adapt culturally, not only survive. Survive differs from cultural adaptation. Cultural adaptation signifies situation where a people can maintain own tradition and adapt according to Sami values, customs and traditions. In the tangible cultural heritage can survive only if the traditions, indigenous languages and practices are being used in everyday life. I thank the audience for interest. Thank you so much, Klamati. Those were some really enlightening remarks and hopefully we'll get to expand a little bit more about indigenous cultural heritage and intangible cultural heritage protection during our discussion. Our next speaker that we have is Robert Kazir. Robert is an associate program specialist at UNESCO's World Heritage Marine Program in the Natural Heritage Unit. He is based in Paris and works on state of conservation dossiers and the UN Decade on Ocean Science and Capacity Building Initiatives in Marine World Heritage Sites, a very topical area these days on Arctic heritage. Uh, Robert, you have the floor. Yes, and thank you for the organizers for bringing us all together and for organizing this webinar on this uh, important topic. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about about natural heritage, which I think um, is, is especially relevant for the Arctic because of the increasing um, attention that the world is giving to the interconnectedness between natural and cultural heritage. Um, and nothing actually symbolizes this more uh, than the emblem of the World Heritage Convention. So when we have meetings normally, I start with this emblem and I ask the group who has seen it before on maybe entrance plates or placards entering a World Heritage site, but who actually knows what it means. So the World Heritage emblem um, combines the round circle um, representing the natural heritage with the square in the middle, which represents um, uh, human genius or the gifts, the gifts of, um, of creativity of man. And so it, it represents this interdependence of the world's natural um, and cultural diversity. Um, so myself, I work at um, at the World Heritage Center, which is the um, which is the Secretariat of the World Heritage Convention. Um, the World Heritage Committee is a rotating body of 21 member states. So the, it's the World Heritage Committee that decides on, on new inscriptions. Um, and how they do this is to look at, uh, or, or states, parties, countries have to submit nomination dossiers um, in which they justify why they think that a specific site is of outstanding universal value. And this is really the concept that underpins World Heritage. Um, everybody knows the UNESCO World Heritage List, World Heritage Sites, but why are some sites on the list? And this is because they, they are of, um, or they are considered to be of outstanding universal value. And countries have to, um, in, in very sometimes dossiers of thousand pages that take many years to prepare, countries have to document this and they have to 
explain how this how their sites um, first of all meet at least one of the 10 criteria of outstanding universal value. So there are six cultural criteria and four natural criteria. They also need to show how the, um, the surface area of the site that they are proposing meets the conditions of integrity for natural sites or authenticity for cultural and mixed sites. And this means, for example, if you um, if, if it's about a waterfall, then the inscribed or the proposed property should not only include the actual waterfall, but also the catchment area, because the waterfall depends on, um, on, on, on the catchment area. And thirdly, um, sites must have a dedicated protection me and me mechanism in place that allows um, the protection and safeguarding and transmitting that those outstanding universal values um, to future generations. And it's the World Heritage Committee that um, evaluates all of this with the advice from um, for natural sites. The advisory body is IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, and for cultural sites, um, it's, it's ECOMOS. Um, and so I would really uh, recommend everybody to look at our website. So the, the World Heritage Center website includes, is really a, a hidden treasure trove of information, I would say, because for all those currently 1,121 World Heritage Sites, so about uh, 250 natural sites, 950 um, cultural sites. And so you can find so much information on the website, um, the nomination dossier, which, which, which are really detailed, um, reports from states' parties where they uh, submit on a regular basis updates on, on the, the management system um, and how the site is still well protected, but also recommendations um, and decisions from the World Heritage Committee. So this is here just one, one example of, of some concrete recommendations that the World Heritage Committee um, uh, gave to, uh, to Denmark um, on, on, on this site. And you can find this, uh, so this is really useful, very concrete, a lot of analysis that is, that is a, a tremendous source of information. This is just a bad print screen from the map, so you can see um, a distorted worldview, but you can clearly see there are not many World Heritage Sites, so the green dots are natural sites, um, yellow culture, red on the danger list, and green, yellow are mixed sites, both natural and cultural. And you can clearly see that there are not many dots in the Arctic. And so many studies and many people, organizations, have highlighted this gap, this Arctic gap um, in the Arctic. Uh, and what, what I have worked on here at the World Heritage Marine Program is that we looked a couple of years back, we looked especially at marine ecosystems and which marine, eco which, which marine ecosystems um, could potentially be of outstanding universal value. And this is a report that we published um, with IUCN and, uh, and NRDC uh, a couple of years ago, um, which basically identified, so not specific spots, but looked really at an ecosystem perspective of which ecosystems are really unique um, in that they are not yet on the World Heritage List, because the list is supposed to be um, uh, a collection, uh, a representative collection uh, of, of all those different, of all the different ecosystems, uh, if, we, if we talk only of nature, that could potentially be of outstanding universal value. And so this was, for example, the Bering Strait ecoregion, um, one of the world's great migration corridors, also included the Northeast Water Polynia ecoregion, which, which, which is the area where um, multi-year sea ice might, uh, might persist for the longest period of time, if we look um, a couple of decades uh, ahead. This included also the Northern Baffin Bay ecoregion. And um, in 2018, I think Canada also submitted a site on its tentative list, um, which was partially in, in, in this area, uh, near Lancaster Sound. Disco Bay and Store, Helviske Banker, uh, connecting with an, an already existing site, the Illicit Ice Fjords, because some of these Arctic sites are, of course, um, are also connecting with other mar marine sites or, mar or World Heritage sites already on the list. Think of the Wadden Sea in Germany, uh, Netherlands and Denmark, where some of the birds, which are part of the outstanding universal value, spend part of their time in the Arctic. So from this integrity perspective, it's also important that some sites in the Arctic um, uh, are, are recognized. The Scoresby Sound, Polynia, the world's largest fjord system, the high Arctic archipelagos, of course, with Svalbard, Franz Josef um, lands. Also here, I think Svalbard is already partly on the um, tentative list of, uh, of Norway. The Great Siberian Polynia as a, a, yeah, an, um, a, 
a, a spectacular example of a Polinia ecosystem, which is currently not on the list, the World Heritage List. And so this was basically an exercise to inspire um, Arctic countries, states, parties, to look more at marine ecosystems and to try to fill this Arctic marine gap um, on the World Heritage List. And some of the conclusions that were formulated um, through this exercise was that um, countries in the Arctic that are looking to fill this gap, they could do this by, for example, update their tentative lists. So a tentative list is some kind of a waiting chamber where countries put um, sites, they, they, they put forward sites that they intend to nominate for, for the World Heritage List. So you can also access this on the World Heritage Center website, um, what, what sites your country has already put forward as possible World Heritage Sites. And this exercise showed that in looking at marine and natural, even the tentative lists do not at all address the gaps um, that still exist. So a second conclusion was um, maybe not, yeah, not, so, not so surprising um, to provide enhanced protection for some of these places, especially in light of climate change, uh, where, where there is such a rapid change that some of the ecosystems we looked at um, and that might be of potential outstanding universal value might disappear before they are actually even um, recognized uh, or inscribed on the list. Another recommendation was to look more um, holistically at potential outstanding universal value. So we looked specifically at marine, um, but of course the, it, it's important to look at this, um, to look at other values, to especially link with cultural um, and the traditional knowledge perspective, because many of these marine areas, natural areas are, are intrinsically linked with, um, with, with the cultural, with uh, hunter grounds or with, with cultural uh, importance um, of the Arctic states. To another recommendation was to look also at the high seas area in the Arctic. And finally, um, of course, to put forward, to prepare or to submit nomination dossiers for uh, World Heritage Sites. Um, since this report has been published and shared with the, with the Arctic uh, states parties, no new sites have been put forward. So I think now there are 15 um, World Heritage Sites in the Arctic. But in terms of marine, it's only Canada that I think in 2018 um, put about four or five new sites on the tentative list. But um, looking, at, at looking at the Arctic uh, overall, there were still many sites to add um, starting on the tentative list if we are really to, um, to address this important gap on, on the World Heritage List. And you can find more information um, on our Arctic, dedicated Arctic page. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, and thanks for sharing with us the excellent work that UNESCO does. It's really inspiring to see the all the work that is put in to try to protect marine heritage in the Arctic. And so thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, our next speaker and our final speaker for today in terms of presentations uh, will be Christian Koch Madsen. Uh, he is a deputy director of Greenland's National Museum and Archives. And he is an Arctic and landscape archaeologist whose research focuses on settlements, land, and use patterns, and long-term ecodynamic in Greenland uh, later prehistory. Uh, Christian, I'll give you the floor now, and I'm very excited to see uh, more about Greenland's heritage. Thank you, Emily, and hello all. And, uh, yeah, you can start the slideshow. Which uh, basically what I'm going to present here is I'm going to provide a little bit of knowledge about the, the situation in Greenland, uh, both in terms of what our heritage world looks like, the challenges we are facing, and, and a little bit about how we've been, been dealing with them. So, yeah, and as you see here from the title, climate is going to play a, a significant part in this. And so please start the next slide. Well, just to give you an overview, we have in, in Greenland uh, quite a lot of heritage sites, cultural heritage sites, uh, over 5,600, which is only, I'm guessing, one tenth of the actual sites out there that haven't been either found or recorded. Uh, they're spread over a country, which is, as you can see, it's, it's a long one. It's a very, very long coastline and it's a marine culture, so most of it is on this long coastline. Um, which makes it difficult. Uh, Greenland National Museum is the central heritage institution. We are essentially the only, only heritage institution in Greenland managing uh, all of these sites. We have 
permanently employed six archaeologists, and then we have a number of uh, other academics. We also have, uh, you see, 150 listed buildings and other buildings that are sort of under other protection. As in other areas of the, the Arctic in the high north, we are, have a, this fantastic situation where we have a unique preservation of the sites. They are basically visible on the surface going all the way back to Greenland's oldest cultures, uh, more than 2,000 years old. We have excellent preservation of organic artifacts, uh, even, uh, even those that are not buried in some places, or I would rather say we used to have <laughs> unique preservation because that's not a general pattern anymore. Next slide, please. So we also have a number of uh, protected sites. We are one of, we have some of the, the World Heritage areas in the Arctic. We have uh, two uh, cultural, which both have a, a, a more site, cultural site component, and then also a living and tangible heritage component. And then there is a natural, uh, natural world heritage area, but which also has some cultural components in it. And then we have a number of protected areas spread out around Greenland, as you see on the right, where the biggest one is the National Park in Northeast Greenland, the world's largest national park, almost a million square kilometers, which we are supposed to monitor as well. So you, you begin to see a picture of what we're dealing with. Next slide, please. Now there, of course, there's many different um, prediction for how the climate is gonna change over the, the, the coming years and centuries, but in general, the, the, the pattern is the same, no matter which model you look at, it's gonna get relatively warmer in the Arctic and relatively wetter, both things that are impacting our cultural heritage and, uh, and preservation. So that's the baseline here. Next slide, please. And uh, so I'm going to start with a horror scenario, which uh, is a little from my own research, uh, which started in, in South Greenland, around the North settlements there, where we knew from old handbooks of the archaeology that there was an excellent state of preservations in the mid 1900s, just around the Second World War. And our project was around going back to these sites and using these materials. So it seemed like a fairly easy project, except that when we returned, there was nothing, nothing left. It's basically bone mush and all the organic artifacts were gone. So we approached a little more systematically and began to, to um, probe sites across the, the entire region. And today we have, uh, I think this is even up to 120 and we have preservation at five sites. So this already suggested us that this preservation was lost in, in a matter of 50 to 80 years, which is extremely rapid when you're looking at our geographic and, and temporal time scale here. Next slide, please. So uh, we coupled up with the national team of Denmark in a, a project that ended uh, in, in 19, which was called the remains of Greenland. You see here the, the, on the left. Uh, basically to put some, some, some more body on these threats and challenges, some numbers uh, so the main aims of this uh, international collaboration, collaboration was to figure out what are the actual threats, how fast and extensive is the damage, and work towards some, some uh, best practices for what can be saved and how. And uh, our main study region, region was the Nuke Fjord, which you see here on the lower right with the, our main target sites, which is basically a logistic uh, set up because it is close to the capital where we are and so it was, we could actually afford going there and that's why we chose this region. Next slide please. So just summarizing what we found in this project is like uh, this is sort of almost a prioritized list of the threats to the cultural heritage sites. It's uh, thawing of permafrost, warming of soil temperatures, which basically just leads to all this uh, nice uh, eco and artifacts being composted, leaving basically nothing. There's only one solution here, and that is to excavate. Uh, coastal erosion, which is a major threat in other areas, of course, we know it proved in our area not to be that significant because most of it is on bedrock. But we know that's also a very local picture. And in other parts of Finland, it is a huge issue, same as everywhere. 
and we can with our economy here small we can't do anything to build sea barriers or anything so we really only have one realistic solution which is excavate and one of the surprises we found was uh, vegetation increase with the warming uh, of course the vegetation is exploding especially in the inner fjord regions and we're hearing this been hearing the, uh, about this from from elders in the smaller communities for years uh, but we also put some numbers on that and of course Besides impairing the visible, visible qualities of the heritage, it's actually doing root damage in the chop. And uh, this is where most of this, the archaeology is here. So well, we can burn it, we can use DDT or anything. So we only have one solution, which is excavate. Then we have a precipitation increase, which is uh, mainly in the form of, of snow. And it, we did find that it is to some extent washing out soils. And, uh, and also creating warmer soils in the top, so increasing the, basically the, the degradation of the organic artifacts. Well, again, we have very little option other than excavating. Then, like in some places, or at least until the COVID hit the world, we were experiencing increased tourism, uh, and were Greenland, the government, were planning on forwarding, and this was supposed to be one of the the main parts of the national economy. Um, and of course, at least to the normal problems with site damage and looting and and uh, here we could manage and monitor. Next slide, please. So what have we done to all face these challenges? Well, basically we are ending up considering sort of both the geographical and the economic confines we are faced with. We only have one solution that's prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. And how we are prioritizing elite, I'm not only talking about the cultural heritage uh, sites. It's we, we uh, are working with a model here where we ascribe them an asset value. And value is of course difficult. It could be cultural, it could be, it has significant to a local community. It could have a historic value. It plays a certain part in Greenland history. It could, be, it could be very rare, or it could have a scientific potential or value. So we're working with all of these at the same time. We, of course, we have a state of conservation, uh, what it's looking like now. We have the preservation conditions, the, basically the threats. And uh, then we document or investigate the most important sites, the most vulnerable sites. And then we basically have to let the rest go because we can't do anything unless uh, a lot of foreign researchers start pouring into the country and helping us. So you can consider this a little, a little cry for help as well. Next slide, please. Well, that was it basically, yeah. So we are, of course, we are working, we are sitting in the Arctic. We are experiencing a lot of interest from foreign uh, researchers wanting to collaborate with Greenland. And, and really our main problem is uh, finding the staff and the time to participate. So there is a lot of people wanting to help, but the ways that the system works it makes it a little difficult for us to actually collaborate just because you know if, if it doesn't the collaboration doesn't come with money or manpower or we are very limited in, in our capacity thank you thank you christian uh, that was a really interesting presentation and i certainly learned a lot i'm sure our audience members too now we have so that concludes the portion of this webinar on presentation so now we have time for discussion and questions. And so how this is going to work is that I will open up the discussion with a couple questions of my own, and then I will provide an opportunity to make sure that each one of you can ask questions. And how this will work is that I'll ask that you put your questions in the chat, and then I will read them out loud. Um, but first thing I want to do is I want to pick up on uh, Christian's last point about international cooperation and what it's like to work with researchers in other countries. And I know that each one of you has experience in doing this. And so the question that I'd like to ask you is what benefits in your experience have you had in working with researchers from other countries, archeologists in other countries uh, from a national perspective? And if you're an international institution, uh, Robert at UNESCO, um, what benefits do you see that international cooperation can give? And do you think that the existing state of international cooperation is good and what, what can be improved? So it's a long question, but it's an evaluation of your experiences 
with international cooperation. And I'll just go in order of the speakers that we heard from uh, to make sure that we get everyone's opinion on this. So Susan, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, okay, um, I see the, the Arctic and particularly the high Arctic as one region. So even though it's divided between several nations and these nations have their own systems and uh, legislation and so on, for the, the, from the scientific point of view, I would see it as one big area where we can all um, teach each other, learn from each other and uh, discuss uh, solutions like um, uh, Christian has uh, just given us the, the main uh, reasons for degradation of cultural heritage in the high Arctic. It's exactly the same in Svalbard, these same things uh, happening. And to be able to discuss these with people all around the Arctic, what, what are you doing about it? How is it affecting you? And so on. I find this to be extremely stimu stimulating, but also very necessary for us all to come a little bit further. Okay. Great, Susan, maybe do you have, just, just briefly, do you have any previous experience in working with other researchers that you'd like to share or mention that were, were beneficial to pursuing this point? Um, when I started working with this, uh, and it sounds a long time ago, it was in 1979, I started um, working in Svalbard with um, archaeologists from the Netherlands and from Russia. Working with was not always the right word, but certainly with the, from the Netherlands, we were more on the same line, a little more difficult to, because of language from, from Russia. But um, seeing them um, excavating their own nation's sites in Norwegian area, we couldn't have done it on our own. We couldn't have come from Norway and, and got the same results out of a Dutch site or a Russian site. So absolutely necessary to have, to have that sort of cooperation. That's great, thank you, Susan. Uh, Frigga? Sorry, I've got a little dog here who's uh, craving my attention, but I'm trying to get rid of him just now by stroking him. Um, yes, what other countries have I worked with? Uh, what were the benefits? What can be improved? Well, I have a very international background, just simply having studied in different places and having had postdocs and projects in different places. And you tend to take those people with you. So it's not something that I build up sitting in one spot and then necessarily reaching out to people. But um, uh, the Netherlands get mentioned a bit. Um, I've taken researchers with me. So I did um, projects while I was based in the Netherlands and we know each other, we know the expertise. So now that I'm in Germany, it's much easier to um, uh, cooperate across boundaries or, or borders, uh, pool money, pool uh, resources. And of course that we're only talking about a few hundred kilometers. I mean, they're not far away at all. It's, I don't know if it were Canadian, it'd be the next town on or something. Um, so I've taken them with me, having worked in Svalbard and Jan Mayen quite a bit, meeting people on the way. Um, yeah, so you, you sort of gather people around you and human resources are, of course, just one of the many resources you need. Right now, though, so watch this space. I am from scratch trying to build up a project um, along the Murmansk coast and then along the, the other uh, uh, Russian stretch of the Barents Sea coast. And I don't know anybody there. So I've got a um, student assistant who speaks Russian doing the networking at the moment. And I am curious how that will work out. I'm hoping to build up a postdoc position working on, uh, on Russian sea mammal hunting. So watch that space. And as for um, the Greenlanding example, I'm thinking, well, I've got this polar archeology span network. Um, we don't have any money, but maybe it's time that we started looking into Arctic mobility grants. So if, if Christian needs manpower over, or person power over in Greenland, well, how do we get them there? I think there are a lot of students, and I'm teaching some of them, a lot of Arctic archaeology, polar archaeology students who come knocking on my door and say, well, how do we get fieldwork experience? And of course, Christian, I'm not going to send them all to you right now, um, because the next, <laughs> yes, exactly, the next factor is, okay, willing people, but where do they get at least a, a common um, uh, baseline of archaeological techniques or whatever is required to them to then um, create this mobility and, and making it a, a good and useful and effective workforce that is needed to deal with all these uh, eroding sites. So this is just a thought and looking forward, because as, as Christian said, sometimes it's just getting the right kind of people in the right place. And even my small projects are already struggling with that. You know. Um, so those are my thoughts. 
Great, thank you, Frika. I uh, just want to double check to see if Clementy is here. I think we may have lost him. Uh, you know, lots of snow up in Finnish Sapmi. So he mentioned that his internet might cut out. So I think we may have lost him. Uh, so in that case, uh, Robert, do you have any thoughts on this question on international cooperation? I think, of course, at, at UNESCO and the World Heritage Convention, um, international international cooperation is the hallmark of the World Heritage Convention. So there are many ways that countries are already um, cooperating. We have, for example, a World Heritage Fund where countries can apply for most of the projects are, are around 50 or 40 or 50,000 um, euros that help with conservation or with management or with training. So there is a whole many mechanisms are already there. One concrete example that I also work, out, work on at the World Heritage Marine Program is that so um, there are currently 50 marine sites on the list. In the, in the Arctic, it's only Wrangel Island in Russia. And so what we do with the managers is to provide a platform where they can often meet and exchange. So we have regular, um, many virtual exchanges, of course, now in the last year. But, ex but for example, um, the West Norwegian Fjords and Glacier Bay have signed a partnership agreement under the auspices of UNESCO, where they exchange uh, monitoring protocols, they exchange um, how they deal with cruise tourism. Um, uh, so we have other ones, for example, there is a big project now um, uh, by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation where we are piloting a project in five World Heritage listed coral reefs where managers also exchange on really concrete things from setting up signs, protocols from it can be something like uh, what, what what kind of toilets can you install in camping grounds that are so as sustainable as possible so on a variety of issues we have this platform where managers are really um, exchanging continu continuously because we have so much to learn um, from each other um, and the third point I was thinking same um, yes e echoing what Susan said in the Arctic it's especially important to look at all of this from an ecosystem perspective of course and to look at um, at, uh, at as, as you have seen on the map, to look at, for example, Svalbard and um, and Franz Josef together, um, and to not look at at this, of course, from within a territory, um, only a territory perspective. Great, thank you, Robert. And uh, in your in your experience with working at the marine sites um, in, in compiling that report and document, did you find that the states were receptive, or how did how did the states receive that report that was prepared? Um, well, I think, for example, Canada, I think, received it well because they have also taken it forward for one of the sites has been put on the tentative list. Um, I think for other, it, for some of the other countries, it was more a useful exercise also that some of the involved scientists could use this um, report um, to, to their own channels, um, yeah, uh, put, a, put a marine Arctic environment higher, higher up the agenda. Um, but so, but officially, I have now not looked at this for this webinar um, because this dates from three years ago. But um, the tentative lists are being updated on a regular basis, so it, it might be possible that other countries have also already updated the tentative list um, with some of these marine sites or to to towards addressing the gaps on the on the UNESCO World Heritage List in the Arctic. Great, thank you, Robert. And I guess that's also a good incentive for each one of us to go to the UNESCO website and check out the tentative lists as well. So thank you. Uh, Christian, any thoughts about international cooperation and working with uh, scientists across and archeologists across the Arctic? Uh, yes, I mean, we've had a lot of, we've had a lot of international collaborations both past and we have ongoing collaboration. And I want to mention one that is ongoing right now which is uh, with the National Museum of Denmark again. And uh, I think this is sort of, in, in many ways, this is exactly how we want a, a project uh, collaboration to be set up that we are not owners of. But in, initially, the, uh, this project, we were involved in the idea stage. It's meaning that we could help shape that project around certain heritage needs that we had. Uh, and also, it, it's a lot more fun when you're part of the idea process while when you, uh, you you apply. And second, they they invited us to be uh, co-PIs on the project, which means we we have a direct part in in how the funding is going to be used. And uh, and this was set up around research. It's basically, it's research around the, the our world heritage areas, our cultural world heritage areas which are relatively new and we are still sort of coming to terms what it, what it actually means having and managing a world heritage area. So the project the research actually filled a gap uh, in our knowledge, in, uh, in our development of strategies, 
So that's almost like the optimal situation for, for us. Now, like the final things that, like, you know, when we have projects coming in, we, we often, we have people wanting to do something in Greenland and we help them set up a project. For instance, they want to excavate something and we can guide them to where to excavate, which is fine. And then they help save some of the, the cultural heritage, but it also creates work for us in the other end, right? So it, it, when you published your paper about animal bone from some, uh, Hello, Inuit site, those bones have to end up in the museum and they have to be stored and they have to be cataloged. And, and these are these kind of things people don't think about, you know, that, that uh, while we're saving archaeology, we are also creating a uh, bulk break. So it basically, I mean, we want, and we want to help our international partners think about all of these aspects because they can be funded as long as you just think about it. You just put them in the application and you can at least get some of it in there. So I think that's some of the things that we look for in, in good uh, in good international collaborations. That's great, thank you, Christian. Uh, so we have three questions from the audience, so I will start asking them now. Uh, so the first question is from Tom Axworthy, who is a great mentor for me, and also the C he was the former CEO of the Walter and Gordon Duncan Foundation in Canada, and is now the chair of public policy at Massey College. Tom writes, uh, I was surprised that there are so few world heritage sites in the Arctic. Aren't indigenous favors, nations in favor of this, so I, the world heritage designation? If so, is this a good idea um, how to move forward with uh, designating more heritage sites in the Arctic? Um, so I'll leave the floor open. I'm not sure if anyone has any thoughts, but a way to jump onto this. But since this is on world heritage sites, maybe First, we'll start with uh, Robert, if you want to jump in on the benefits and drawbacks of World Heritage Designation. And then I think Susan also mentioned something like this. So uh, we'll start with Robert and then go to Susan. Yes, why there are so few? Um, I don't really know. I think there's, maybe, it's of course states parties that countries that propose sites, there is sometimes confusion that it's UNESCO proposing sites, but it's states parties that are proposing uh, property. So um, of course they, they need to do the groundwork and there is um, a lot of consultation. The convention also specifies that there needs to be a lot of, there needs to be a lot of dialogue with lo local communities, of course, not only dialogue, but they have to be completely involved in the whole process. Um, so I can only on, on our end, yeah, I don't really know. We have, we can identify the gaps um, but we have never received um, communication that um, that there would not be um, an, um, a wish from local communities to to move forward with that. Um, in terms of advantages, and of course the advantages are that um, it comes with an international sort of recognition of this heritage. Um, uh, so that, that, that's that's important. You also gain access to a pool of of expertise, as I said, for example, with us at the marine program. Um, many of these marine site managers, they know each other already. They, they can really work together and pool knowledge. Um, uh, so that's, that's definitely an advantage. Um, also an advantage, I would say, from, from the perspective of monitoring, is that once a site is on the list, that's actually only the beginning of the story. So you always read in the news normally once a year, the site is on the list. Uh, look all the new sites, the UNESCO sites, that the sites are subject, once they are on the list, subject to continuous monitoring. So a lot of attention, low, what used to be a local problem suddenly becomes or gets global attention. Um, so it really helps to put, if there is a threat, to put it higher up on the, um, on the agenda and the priority lists. Um, I think in the terms of disadvantages, of course, they can be more, I think somebody said it before, increased visitation, but that all depends on the management plan. It can be, this can of course be um, predicted and if there can be in a management plan, uh, uh, a cap on tourism or this can all be prepared normally in advance. Um, and that depends on the, um, on the state party, of course. And just to add that there is always confusion, but UNESCO is not getting any funding from visitor fees from, from World Heritage Sites. So, um, that's that's one of the stories that goes around, but um, that that's not the case. Uh, thank you, Robert. Susan, do you have anything to add? Uh, <clears throat> yes, this will just be my own thoughts about it. Why there are not uh, so many sites in the Arctic, and I think there are quite a number of different reasons. Um, I think maybe one of them was that the, the countries around the Arctic that have Arctic yeah, areas have had. Um, other sites in mind first, that they, they have a number of sites in their, the lower part of their countries that they've wanted to look after uh, through World Heritage System. 
I can mention Norway that has how many sites does it have now? About nine or something, nine, ten, uh, all on the mainland. Svalbard has been suggested on the, the tentative list, but um, it, mainland sites have gone in front. I think another reason could be that uh, a lot of the high Arctic sites, they don't have local communities. Local commu communities are often interested in, in gaining some sort of economic benefit from uh, world heritage status. Um, and uh, a lot of the sites that we put on as being uh, very significant are not in, uh, anywhere near to, um, to uh, habitation. Um, and uh, what other reasons might there be? But uh, yeah, I, like I said, Svalbard has been on the tentative list for many years now in Norway. And there's also been discussion about the, the nature contra cultural heritage. Uh, the cultural heritage side, which included me, thought that the historic coal mining should be a part of this heritage site, whereas the nature side <laughs> said definitely no, nothing that looks like people have disturbed the nature should be on this uh, area, the area that's chosen. So it ended up as saying the sites that are already preserved for, for nature and very old cultural heritage could be on the site. Well, they're already well looked after through the local legislation. So it is just so far petered a little bit out. I can't answer for all the other areas of the Arctic. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you, Susan. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in now. So I think uh, I'll just move on to the next question by Edward Hall. Um, or Christian, did you have something? Oh yeah, I just yeah. wanted to add a okay. perspective on the on the UNESCO <laughs> sites, and, uh, and this is not a I'm not a whining here, but uh, we always because of uh, you know we are such small communities here, and such small eco economies that we have a very low practical approach to to some of this, and uh, I mean for one of our heritage areas where I was part in the process it was like 15 years in the making. Just getting that one year is well, a lot of investment in academics writing this report and, and you know the, the demand from UNESCO are also increasing over the years. We have to be more and more detailed and build and, and that's fair enough with the, with the growing, but it just takes a long time. It's a huge investment in just getting there. And then as Robert mentioned, that's basically just the start. <laughs> the real work starts when you're inscribed and then you have to doing all the stuff that you, you promised in your management and plan. And, and again, that's very expensive. And so everything has to be balanced. You, you can't inscribe anything unless you are prepared to take on that, the, the task of actually protecting this. And, uh, and here there's sort of, there's also a little, there's an idealistic world and the realistic world with where politicians often, you know, press for inscribing UNESCO uh, properties, not out of deep love for the heritage, but they have other perspectives and ambitions. Uh, of course, tourism is one of the, the major things, uh, which means that they're not always, you know, ready to follow up when it comes to actually protecting the heritage, which makes us, for instance, as a heritage institution, we, we push back and you say, well, if you want to do this, you need to have all the stakeholders on board, we need to have commitment from the municipalities and from, so everything needs to run the area once it's up, uh, once it's, it's possibly inscribed. Great, great. Thank you, Christian, for that uh, sobering, sobering words uh, to remind us about the benefits and drawbacks of UNESCO heritage destination. Uh, and the next question is directed to you again, Christian, but I think Frigga, you have something to say about this. Uh, it's from Edward Hall and the, and the point made is I appreciate the point that Christian made about the cost of collaboration on available staff and infrastructure of the host. What do you recommend as a possible solution and how could resources be provided? I think maybe this ex expands a little on the proposal that Frigga you talked about a bit earlier about how to collaborate um, and getting those mobility grants, grants, but maybe both of you can uh, talk a bit more about that. Well, I'll just um, jump in there. Um, getting things funded, especially if it's across uh, national boundaries, of course, is in is a factor um, and we've mentioned um, organizations, institutions such as IASC now, the International Arctic Science Committee a few times, there are pots of money around um, and early career researchers um, are um, more and more well supported and, and, and you kind of need to be, at the moment, if you're talking from an individual uh, point of view, 
Um, you need to be on your feet. You need to see what's out there. You need to click your way through various websites. You know, go to the Apex website, um, Association of Early uh, Polar Early Career Scientists. Um, they have a great list of resources there. So on an individual individual level, I think you can increase your own mobility and look for the opportunities, but that's not particularly structured yet. The question is if, for instance, from um, the chairmanship of the Polar Archaeology Network, I or we as a board should do more to make IAS, uh, for instance, aware that there is this need and, and uh, create more structure that way. Um, Different countries have things, um, for instance, Norway with the Arctic, uh, is, it, is it just Norway? The Arctic Field Grant, where you can very specifically say, I want to, as a master's student or PhD student, I want to get myself into the field for this and this reason. And then you apply to the Arctic Field Grant and um, mobility is increased that way. But who exactly would be the person or the persons organizing all of this and bringing these uh, resources together and making it all possible? I mean, like Christian said, he was involved 15 years in, um, a particular project, it's meet, uh, intermediate to long-term planning and it doesn't just happen from scratch. Christian, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I, I guess I mentioned the core of it when I described the other project. So it's really about, you know, thinking how and, and, and initiating an early dialogue about how can our project contribute to the community or the museum, depending on what kind of project it is. Like how, how can I directly and also financially, you know, do something positive with this research and how can I leave that research with whoever I'm, I'm working with in a way that they can use it. And, and then make sure that that process is funded as well. If it's, uh, you know, if it takes local guides or uh, uh, local, you know, almost like diplomats in the local societies or translation of material or production of media, or, but always think them in and, and apply for funding for it and not sort of as a something secondary, but something high up in the, in the priorities. Can I just come up with a short, short remark? But it's very obvious through both through my work with IASC and through I sat on the uh, polar panel of the uh, Norwegian Research Council. But when you're applying for money nowadays, it pays to have an international um, profile on your project, your research project. And in fact, it's it's uh, made a specific um, demand that either IASC or Research Council of Norway, for example, that you must have two or three other uh, countries with you, researchers from other countries. Um, and that's, um, I think, probably uh, in many other places as well, because this international aspect is recognized now to be so important. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, we have, I'm going to jump to a written question before we go to you, Christian Thomas. Uh, I recognize you have your hand up. This question is from Rachel Phelps Horton. Uh, this question reads, considering the current international laws and policies of natural resource co-management, which laws have you experienced to be first conducive to collaboration and growth and second prohibitive to this? Um, so I guess maybe we'll just go uh, to Robert first and then uh, Frigga, Christian and Susan about international laws and which helps and hinder uh, research. Um. That's a good question because it takes a while before I can answer. Um, well, I would say from the experience that we have seen at at at, at, um, at marine sites, there are many different legal mechanisms. Of course, for example, in the Pacific, you have the you have the customary legal systems that are that have equal value as the as as, as other legal legal systems. Um, so you have you have seen many different laws, and I wouldn't say that one works better. And the other, it just depends on the, um, I would say, the mindset in the country and the people involved. If if there is, if there are different layers of bureaucracy, um, I think that can maybe slow down the process more than um, um, than laws. There are some countries who have, for example, added uh, World Heritage specifications directly in the law. I think, for example, South Africa has um, has a World Heritage Bill. That means then that 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 is in that sense efficient because it helps to. Um, 
have more resources allocated for the World Heritage Protection, and also make sure that development or other issues are um, are, are are more regulated um, in compared to a site or a country that um, that looks at these things more on, on an ad hoc basis. I, th I think I haven't replied fully, fully the question, but sorry. That's okay. Uh, great, thank you, Robert. Uh, Frigga, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? I'm sorry, I tried to find the question in the chat um, and for myself have now just only written down international laws question oh. mark. Could you quickly um, um, ask the question again? Yeah, of course, yes. I think it was a private message sent to me, so that's why I couldn't uh, be seen. But the question is, considering the current international laws and policies of natural resource co-management, which laws have you experienced being first conducive to collaboration and growth and second prohibitive to this? Um, with my research focus being on Svalbard and Jan Mayen, um, it's, it's of course uh, Norwegian law and more specifically for Svalbard also the Spitsbergen Treaty that applies. So when I check the websites yearly, I do this every day, um, every year before I go into the field, whether anything has changed, any new rules have come up. Um, I, uh, the, the, the bottom line, the one that applies to the work up there is that um, anything human made that dates to before the year 1946, and this is different to anywhere else I've worked. So 1946 um, is a cutoff point, is automatically protected as um, cultural heritage. And uh, Susan, I hope I got this right and didn't butcher it too badly, but anything before 1946, which just shows um, that Arctic cultural heritage has a different kind of standing um, in the world because other archaeologists that I deal with here in Germany never quite believe me when I say, no, really, my grandmother was already 26 years old, it's cultural heritage. And another thing that affects my work um, up in Svalbard is, is something that isn't law, but that is um, agreed on voluntarily by um, AECO, the Association of... Um, expedition cruise operators up there. This is something that the industry feels, so the tourism industry feels is, is necessary to do and adhere to um, voluntary commitment to the preservation and conservation of nature as well as cultural heritage. And the guidelines that they give, visitor guidelines and guidelines on how to deal with you know, living animals as well. Um, I've always found it very pleasant to work with these voluntary and I say voluntarily, you can, you can join the association and adhere to their codes. I found it, um, yeah, pleasant, but also reassuring that this is an Arctic, so a circumpolar association and uh, looking into best practice when it comes to cultural heritage. So it might not be solid law, but it's something that a big group of people is now adhering to, which includes cultural heritage and uh, monument protection. Emily, did you freeze? It looks like Emily has frozen. Uh, so I think we are also at uh, about time. Unfortunately, we are at our hour and a half. Um, but I see that we have so many more questions in the chat which means that this was a great, uh, a great webinar, that it produced more questions that we can answer and the start to continued conversations. And I see Emily is back on, so I'm going to hand it back over to her to continue moderating as we finish things up today. Yeah, sorry, I think my internet just cut out for a second there, uh, but I think, uh, were we all, wrapped up in terms of, I think, I just caught the end of that. I think Victoria was wrapping us up for today. Um, can, can I still make a remark or it's too late? Yes, go ahead. Of course, I just didn't, I, I'm, a, I'm very aware of the, of the time. So I just want to make sure that it's okay with you. Um, but please, I would, I would especially welcome any comments from Susan and, and Robert and Frigga to continue uh, your remarks that, that was there. But uh, so Robert, please go ahead. 
As just linked to all the questions on, on science and resources, just want to highlight that uh, this year we are starting the UN Decade of Ocean Science. So many countries have an action plan, a dedicated set of resources. So um, if you can link your, your research work, if that links with the priorities in your country's action plan, that might open up new avenues for funding, I think. Um, World Heritage Sites, uh, maybe yeah, some, some World Heritage Sites are also identified as a priority area. Um, so if you look in those, um, also in those ecosystem restoration, another decade as well starts, that might also open up um, uh, resources. Just an a tip. Great, thank you, uh, Robert. It's uh, Susan or Frigga, did you have anything to add to this? Um, I can just add something about the, the, the legislation that helps for scientists and, and doesn't help for them. Um, I'm not quite closely attached to it anymore, but uh, a few years ago, there was the Arctic uh, Council scientific agreement that uh, was finally accepted after many years of discussions, which were pretty difficult because it was actually to facilitate um, cross-border for both scientists uh, uh, and equipment, not least scientific equipment and uh, for visas and all that sort of thing to make this much easier to happen um, with perhaps particular attention towards Russia where it was a little bit difficult for, for some um, proce processes uh, of taking scientific equipment and, and getting visas and so on and so forth. And this was uh, finally agreed, but it's not as easy as it sounds because uh, in some case, the nat national laws still uh, go over the scientific agreement. For example, if you are a soil scientist and you go to Russia on a project to collect soil samples to uh, investigate when you get back home to your laboratory, you're not allowed to take any part of the motherland out of Russia, including your soil samples. So things like that are still causing problems, but certainly the Arctic Council has been doing its best to help facilitate uh, cross-border international scientific work in the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And Frank, I just want to give you another chance in case you said something, because I cut out right in the middle of your remarks. And I'm not sure if you had a chance to fully wrap up. Uh, what you I, um, I just apologize to uh, Rachel for not actually answering her question at all, as I'm now seeing it in the chat, it was resource management related. Um, so in Svalbard, this would be the case of coal mining. And um, recently, uh, the work of the archaeologists and the wrapping up of the coal mining up there, they've been working hand in hand with a position for an archaeologist currently being out to survey and, and monitor the deconstruction of some of the mining infrastructure there. So. Um, apologies to Rachel for not being more specific, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Frigga, and I just want to conclude today's webinar by saying thank you especially to all the speakers for being very generous with their time and for sharing your expertise and insights on this. Uh, cultural heritage in the Arctic from a social science and from a humanities perspective is an area that I personally believe that there should be more research and more dialogue on. Uh, and this is a great way to continue and to expand that dialogue. So thank you very much, Susan, Frigga, Clementi, who dropped off, Christian, and Robert for being here today. And I'm sure we'll all be following all your work uh, very closely moving on. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to all our guests for taking an hour and a half to listen to our speakers today. Thank you. <laughs>